Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Garland, and I am the resident choreographer for the Dance Theater of Harlem Company, and I'm director of the Dance Theater of Harlem School, and I'd like to welcome you to another DTH Founders Week event. Today, we have really had a wonderful moment in recounting, going back to the history of the Dance Theater of Harlem in the Washington, D.C. community. I cannot let this moment go by without first saying that our illustrious artistic director, Ms. Virginia Johnson, is a DC native and started dancing there under Therrell Smith, who is now I think 101 years old, and eventually made her way to New York to become a fledgling member of the now 52-year-old organization, the Dance Theater of Harlem. So we have some wonderful panelists with us today. We have Ashante Green. Uh, after that, that will be, we will have Miss uh, Jeanette McCune. After that, we will have Ms. Donna Walker Kune. She with a K, Ms. McCune with a C. <laughs> and then last but not least, the wonderful Ms. Sandra Fortune Green. So welcome, ladies. So what I'll do is I will cycle through. Uh, a brief conversation about just who you are. We'll watch some photos and videos of you. You can make some comments and then we can go through that uh, uh, cycle. And then I want to backtrack and talk a little bit about what your recollections of Mr. Mitchell are with regards to the art form and having known him and having worked with him. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, I'd like to start with the little one. I'm, I know you're gonna be mad at me for that because you're not little anymore, Mr. Shante. Mrs. Ashante Green. Ashante Green uh, was a member of the Dance Theater of Harlem Residency for years and years and years. In fact, in the video, you will see pictures of her with many, many different Dance Theater of Harlem teachers. Uh, after graduating from high school, she received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in 2014 and a Master's of Science degree in Performing Arts Leadership and Management in 2015 from Shenandoah University. And currently she's a school manager and creator director of the Dance Institute of Washington. And the reason that's significant is because that organization was founded by a former DTH company member, Mr. Fabian Barnes. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna look at a video. The video actually starts out with a video of the late Fabian Barnes. He did pass some years ago. Of the late Fabian Barnes talking about how he made his way to DC and then it concludes with Ms. Ashante Green talking about her work that she does currently in the DC area. All right, so Heather, let's roll with Ashante's video tape. So in 1978, Dance State of Harlem came to Seattle for the first time. Uh, I had already made it up in my mind as a young kid taking dance at age 11 that I was gonna go to Dance State of Harlem someday. And in 78, when they came, I was right there for the first master class. And subsequently, the director, Arthur Mitchell, invited myself and my brother to come to New York to study with the company. Um, not only did it set my life on a path, it also saved me from what I saw as my possible future had I not had something to really devote my time and energy to my journey. In 1995, I left the company for the last time. I had left back in 84 for a leave of absence and studied cooking and come here to Washington and done some teaching um, on his recommendation at the Jones Haywood School of Ballet. But in 95, I um, decided to put my full energy into developing the Dance Institute of Washington and um, a famous critic wrote once about the work I was trying to do and the byline said that um, he's taking a leaf from the book of the Dance Theater of Harlem and Arthur Mitchell. And that is really what I've tried to do. Hi, my name is Ashante Green and I'm from Fort Washington, Maryland. And I started dancing pre-professionally at the age of seven and I was with the Dance Theater Harlem's residency program, training with Arthur Mitchell and the late Fabian Barnes. And I have a background in ballet, modern, African, hip hop, and tap. 
So I realized that I wanted to continue learning in arts and nonprofit world. So I was accepted into an accelerated program, Performing Arts Leadership, where I received my master's. Currently, I am working with the Dance Institute of Washington. I oversee its pre-professional training program. I encourage young artists to chase after their dreams. Don't let anyone or any place or thing stop you from going after your goals. You are in control of your destiny, and I just encourage you to stay the course, keep your head up, and stay connected. Yes, stay in your network and keep that network going because you never know who will be able to help you, help you start your career. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Ashante, I, 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 there's so much. I mean, first of all, it's so amazing that you become this wonderful, amazing young woman now after so many years. And, I, and I'm going to be honest with you. Ms. Mitchell knew that you'd be doing exactly what you're doing now. You know, he commented off and he would point to you across the room and say, that girl, she's going to do stuff. She's going to do stuff. She's so smart. She's so smart. Uh, it's so, so, so amazing. And he had a knack for recognizing that. So, um, so Ashante, and, and actually it was under the Aegis, the program of Jeanette McCune that, that you worked, but Ashante, what was it like on those real mornings when you didn't feel like going, and you knew Arthur Mitchell was gonna show up? <laughs> Mercy. When we knew Arthur Mitchell was going to show up, oh my, I'm telling you, it was like, we couldn't sleep at night, but we knew we had to show up, we had to arrive. And it was just a great feeling and experience to be able to work closely with him. Um, one thing he he did not play, and if you came and you were sleeping at the bar, he would wake you up. Um, <laughs> he would make sure you were awake. And it, it was just a level of discipline that really allowed me to be where I am today. Uh, one thing I will never forget is the give, take, and show. Um, give, take, show. Actually, it, it's something about arriving and also having a level of confidence and uh, authenticity to just be yourself. I think that really it's important to stand your ground and be true to who you are. And that's giving your best. And then you yeah. have to show it and show it without apologizing. So, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Ashanti, I don't know if you heard, we had a ma everyone um, that's watching. We had a master class earlier today with four schools from the DC area and Dance of Harlem. Washington School of Ballet, Dance Institute of Washington, uh, City Dance, uh, Jones Haywood, and then Dance of Harlem. And one of the things that Monica Stevenson fr uh, from Washington School of Ballet remembers as well was the give take show, you know? And, and it, even though it, it sort of was a thing that we always said, it, it gave us this idea about ourselves that was really Beautiful and lovely. Thank you, Ashanti, for for that. Oh, I, and and let's talk a little bit about before I move on to Jeanette about Fabian um, being in his space and doing that work, continuing that legacy. Yes, it was no mistake that uh, back in 2014 I came to visit him. I was on summer break from college, getting ready to go back to receive my master's, and he was interested in me helping out. It felt like home. And I'm so grateful that he gave, believed in me and gave me the opportunity to return and to work closely with him. I actually had the opportunity before he passed away to sit in meetings with him. Um, I believe he knew what he was doing. Um, I, I think that I'm, I have chills right now, uh, just knowing that he trusted me and then our wonderful uh, executive director, Kahina Haynes, but it's just a wonderful experience to continue his legacy and the work that he created in the DC area. Yeah, you know, um, many times Arthur Mitchell has met people, like when I ran the school the first time, there were two guys, I'll never forget that auditioned for the school, one Robert Brace from London, another one Nikes Makoso, who weren't real ballet dancers at the time, they just wanted to come study someplace. And so Mr. Mitchell looked at them as well and was like, these guys are gonna do things 
And now Robert Grace is an amazing trainer for the stars. And Nikkei is an amazing stage manager, backstage uh, production uh, type person. So yeah, you, you are falling in line with, with that wonderful eye he had. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to Jeanette McCune, hey. my partner in crime so many years at the Kennedy Center Residency. Um, let's cycle through some pictures and I'll, I'll, I'll come on the back end and talk about what we see. So Heather, let's just go through all the pictures really quickly. Awesome. So the last uh, picture that you saw were, were, was the end of our culminating event. Uh, after 20 weeks of going down and teaching every weekend, we would have a culminating event that Jeanette would have to manage. Uh, she also managed the audition for the program. Uh, in some of the pictures, there was one picture actually I did not size properly that has two students in it that are doing really well. But uh, Devin Louie, who is now in the Paul Taylor Dance Company, uh, uh, Jazz Bynum, who's in the court of ballet at Ballet West. Um, uh, Janelle Figgins, who's at Aspen Santa Fe. Samantha Figgins, who is in the Alabama American Dance Theater. Wonderful dancers. Keenan English, who's at the Carol Carolina Ballet. So, so Jeanette, can you talk a little bit about of those pictures? You were in the studio there with him. He had a shoe and a, and a crowd of girls <laughs> listening to the man. Yeah, those, oh my gosh, that just brought me back for so many years. So just to give a quick level set for those who don't know, uh, Mr. Mitchell was a Kennedy Center honoree in 1993. And that's actually what started the Dance Theater of Harlem residency at the Kennedy Center. There was a great desire for Mr. Mitchell to be able to leave a legacy, not dissimilarly to what he does in New York, in New York um, but to start a program as many dancers did end up coming from the DC area and did end up in the company. So it really created a pipeline, but not only a pipeline of dancers in the company, but of really exceptional young leaders that went not only to Dance Theater of Harlem, but to companies all over the world or professionals that impacted other, other arenas, other professional arenas. And so those, the image that you saw was an audition day. Um, there were always questions about, do I have the right shoe? Um, what, you know, what is the best one for my foot? And so Mr. Mitchell not only was a great eye for talent, but he was someone who always was teaching whether it was an audition, whether it was us, I'm a non-dancer, I'm a musician. Um, but what I found really helpful was he always took the time to explain what the, what the value of the work was and to really try to, to deconstruct ballet. Um, and as Robert, as you said, that picture at the end was the culminating event. The students would be selected. We usually had between 80 and 100 young people in varying levels um, from beginner all the way up to our most advanced students and we would have a culminating event in one of our theaters, um, in this case, a concert hall or opera house, seating over 2000 people. Um, and they would be able to come and demonstrate in some of the beautiful regalia that, that you all would send in from Dance Theater of Harlem so they'd have the true experience. But let me turn yes. it back to you because I know you have more questions. <laughs> yes, well, and also uh, I have a video representing one of those culminating events. Um, I will let everyone know that Jeanette has been at the Kennedy Center since 2001. She was a manager of community partnerships, an assistant director for teacher and school programs, a director for DC school and community initiatives. And now she's a director of the school and community programs and also sits on the board of the wonderful Duke Ellington School. Yay. So mm -hmm. uh, can we pull up uh, the video from the Kennedy Center for Jeanette McCunes, please? Thank you. publicly acknowledge Jeanette McCune, who's the Assistant Director of Teacher and School Programs here. This is her 10th year of being part of this program. Jeanette, thank you very much. She's backstage. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Virginia Johnson, who is the Artistic Director of Dance Theater of Harlem. Please welcome her. We're looking forward to continuing this, building a stronger connection between us and Washington, D.C. 
I'm very excited to be here this afternoon, and one of my great pleasures is to introduce to you the Artistic Director Emeritus of Dance Theatre of Harlem, Arthur Mitchell, who will conduct the evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm free. Not even 60 hours. But it's amazing because they are committed, they want to do it, and it is, in a sense, their life. And the skills that they're learning here are preparing them for life, no matter what they want to do. The discipline and the focus that they achieve here are the skills to make them better businessmen, teachers, lawyers, doctors, whatever they want to do. They realize they're only going to get out of it what they put into it. So without further ado, I'd like to start the program. Dancers, places, here we go. Chins up, look, focus, and here we go. And yeah. One, one, one. One, two, one. One, two, one, two, three, and up. Give, take, show. There you go. <laughs> okay, let's come into the center. Jeanette, um, I, I'm sure that brings back some memories there. Oh my gosh, yes, <laughs> I remember that day vividly. I mean, when it came up, I got chills just seeing that moment. Yes, yes, yes. In terms of, of if you could um, uh, encapsulate before I move on to Donna, uh, Mr. Mitchell's philosophy, what, what most impressed you with him in that way? Well, Mr. Mitchell really, he was always wanting, really wanting to teach um, he also was a great believer in, you know, it was really interesting watching him. He could watch someone walk in the door. And as you identified with Ashante, he could see something in a young person in the way they carried themselves. He could see the opportunity for them to be more than what they thought they could be. And then he was just really phenomenal about nurturing that. I really so enjoyed watching him in those moments um, as those young people came in. But he was so invested in every single dancer being the best that they could be. And he had really high expectations, but he invested in them. That's really what stood out. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you. And again, we'll go through everyone and then we'll come back to some of those ideas. Uh, next up is Donna Walker Kuhn. Okay, so there I was, a young kid at Dance at Harlem. And Donna was pretty much a young kid too. <laughs> and she was working with Mr. Mitchell. Um, Donna Walker Kuhn, at the time I met her, was Mr. Mitchell's assistant, but now she's like, Ashante, you need to get to know this woman, I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> uh, she started as director of marketing at Dance of Harlem. She was at Joseph Pat Public Theater as director of marketing and community affairs with the wonderful George Wolf, just amazing. Mm -hmm. 
She's founder and president of her own uh, Walker International Communications Group, and now with the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, uh, she's senior advisor and, uh, uh, and of community engagement. She's also an author, a professor, and a blogger. So, Donna, yes. can I just tell a story? I don't know if you remember this, but my my running buddy in the school in in the company was Keith Thomas. Yeah, and we were in a, a, a foreign country in South America, mm -hmm. and we. Uh, let's just say having too much of a good time in a place that we shouldn't have been. <laughs> and I'll never forget, you got out of a car with Arthur Mitchell and it was like a cartoon where he was this small. And as he got closer to me, he became like <laughs> 90 feet tall. <laughs> and it was the first time he had ever said the words to me, you are representing something larger than yourself. Oh, it was enough for And I'll never forget that I'd heard him say it before, but I was mortified that he had to say it to me. Yes. So do you have anything to add to that before we get to your video? The touring with Mr. Mitchell was absolutely priceless because the company was welcomed as royalty around the world, not in the United States so much, but definitely abroad. So when we were touring in Europe and South America and Egypt, you know, we really were treated as if we were the best. And so that was such an amazing experience. I remember in, in uh, Argentina, we had security. We had cars with drivers. You know, uh, Amelita Fortobot at that time was the fourth wealthiest woman in the world. And she invited the entire company, which at that time we were touring with around 40 or 50 people, plus tech, plus musicians, to one of her uh, penthouse apartments. And she had hired these vegan chefs. And I remember walking around her apartment in the rain and all of us with Steph, and we were looking at her fixtures. She had 24 karat gold fixtures and she had all these original Monet's and Van Gogh's. And we would just say, wow, look at this opulence. And she was so uh, happy to have the company there. So those were the kind of experiences that we had because of Mr. Mitchell. You know, he commanded excellence. He commanded yes. you know, this kind of respect that there was no other options for that. And so that was the standard he set for the company and anyone who worked with them. And I always felt so honored to be able to walk with him and to try to translate his vision in so many different ways. Being his first assistant, I didn't have a prototype to follow. So I kind of made it up as I went along. But in my first my first uh, experience touring with him was at Kennedy Center. Uh, I think that was 1986. Yes, because I started okay. in 1984. So it was 1986, wow. and that was my very first experience. And I remember him, uh, you know, standing next to him while the company was doing the dress rehearsal. And he started giving me all these comments, you know, about the leg, the foot, tell this one to look this way. And I was agreeing with him. I said, yeah, I noticed that. He said, no, write it down. I was like, oh, that's my job. <laughs> you know, I learned how to take notes in the dark. You know, while we're sitting in the theater and I learned how to understand him whispering out of the side of his mouth, giving me comments, tell her next time that she needs to do so. -and -so. I learned how to hear that, you know, while yes, I'm yes. looking at the stage. But I also wow. did the umbilical cord that he had with the dancers. And I could literally see him sending energy to the dancers and they would shift. Like if someone wasn't quite on center, he would say, she's not on center. Next thing you know, she was on center. I was like, wow. <laughs> so it was very it was powerful. Incredible. Awesome. Awesome. Wonderful. Listen, uh, and, and, and for those that are watching, uh, uh, Donna, you know, they talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, in, uh, around the board now. But, but the uh, array of women that you're seeing here, Jeanette, Donna, Sandra, they were about that work way before it became popular and people got funding for it. Um, so let's look at um, your comments before uh, American for the Arts, a keynote address. And then I'm gonna come back and ask you a couple questions about that. Okay. Here we go. The point is, is that having, getting an e-blast from someone you know, you feel a lot more inclined to pay attention to it along with all the other layers of marketing, you know, that we used to, to touch these uh, constituents. So that's been really uh, valuable. So when we talk about engaging diverse audiences, I think we have to build bridges, you know, and to plan out a map that figures out what does it take for a person to leave their house to come to your house? What does that look like?
And one of my favorite experiences is when I was with the Dance Theater of Harlem, and it was our first time performing at BAM, Brooklyn Academy of Music. And at that time in the, um, this was I think the early 90s, you know, um, there still was not, well, Dance Theater of Harlem had never performed in Brooklyn. I certainly had not performed at BAM. So there was a lot of concern that, oh, goodness, nobody will come. Because certainly in the 90s, it's a little better now because Brooklyn is so cool. But in the 90s, you needed a passport, inoculations, <laughs> IS, you know, all kinds of things to cross the bridge to get to Brooklyn. So unless you really wanted to do all that, you didn't come. So we were trying to figure out, so who actually is going to come and see us for this two-week engagement at BAM, this, you know, 2,000-plus seat house. And so, you know, I did a number of things building, um, you know, groups and audiences. And there were two things that I think really made a difference. The first was um, an appointment. I went to my doctor. And she said, after I finish with you, I'm going to a meeting. I said, where are you going? Because you know I love meetings and committees. And so I said, where are you going? And she said, well, I'm going to, um, you know, there's a group of black doctors and nurses, and we're going to have our monthly meeting. So immediately I saw headlines. Doctors welcome Dan Field of Harlem at BAM. It was like this ticker tape. It just went through my head. And so I just leaned over and I said, Dr. Clark, would you like to buy out opening night to welcome Dan Field of Harlem to Brooklyn? So she looked at me and she said, are you crazy? We're doctors. I said, I'll help you. So she said, no, they'll, they'll never go for this. So already it was a yes in my head. <laughs> so it never occurred to me that she said no. So we have to be cultural warriors. If someone says no, make it a yes. You make it that way. So always graciously, always polite, but very determined. So I went to... But what uh, happened like uh, two weeks before um, the actual date, uh, Dr. Clark said, let me make a phone call. Following week, we were at 89%. I said, whoa, who did you call? She said, oh, I called our pharmaceutical companies, and I told them we may not be able to accept their deliveries if they didn't support our fundraiser. <laughs> so, and so we performed the Tuesday night to a sold-out audience. Wednesday, headlines above the fold, New York Times, byline by Jennifer Dunning, is there a doctor in the house? Last night, Dan Seward of Harlem performed before an audience of 2,000 medical professionals. So that came from a doctor's visit. And so these are results of antennas. All of us have antennas. When we do this work of cultural engagement, of developing new audiences, we have antennas, which means there's a, there's a sense that we have, there's an intuition that we have that says, go with this, even if you don't have the rest of the answers. I rarely have the whole thing figured out. But I'm so convinced that the arts are always going to be successful that I don't have to worry about that. You know, and as long as it's legal, I'm going to keep plodding away. And so I encourage you. I, I, I love that last line, Donna. As long as it's legal, I'm going to keep plodding away. <laughs> I think everyone on this screen has that, that, that uh, DNA, all of you. <laughs> As long, Donna, any, any comments about that? Donna, I have a question. Was that, because my first Valley Joplin dances was premiered in BAM. And so I think it was premiered during that particular season. The first Valley I did for Virginia way, way back. Yes, yeah. I believe mm -hmm. you are correct. I know we premiered Medea, I believe, with yes. Lisa Adams, because I remember mm -hmm. working with the designer on the poster. I remember being so excited when the brochures were ready. And yes. Lorenzo James, who was a very close friend of the company and at one point had done PR for the company, he was a little more insane than me, which is great. You gotta have people that are a little off center to get the work done. And so it was a huge snowstorm. And then I got a call from the printers, your brochures are ready. I called Lorenzo, I said, Lorenzo, the brochures are ready. He said, I'm gonna get a car. We're gonna go deliver this brochure. In the snowstorm, we're going to the dry cleaners, the grocery store, and we're getting out this brochure. And people just looked at us and said, who are these people? We said, we want you to see Dan Theater of Harlem and BAM. And yes, like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. All right, <laughs> let's, um, and everyone, uh, uh, please save your comments, I'm sure you have uh, stories that, that intersect with what we are talking about. But of course, I've saved the grand dame for last, Miss Sandra Fortune Green, who I knew about for so many years. But I think I met you way, way later. And I think it was at a Kennedy Center residency 
performance. I think it was. Um, uh, so Sandra, um, Arthur Mitchell, when did you first meet him? Well, um, when I think it was early 60s or mid 60s when he was still performing. And I was a recipient of a Ford Foundation scholarship. And so oh. he came to Jones Haywood every Monday to teach the ballet class that I was in. Okay. Excitement of the dressing room because Mr. Mitchell was coming. I never saw so many brushes and perfumes and lotions ever. <laughs> it was wow. so exciting. Every Monday for several years. And wow. that was my first um, exposure to Arthur Mitchell. And awesome. of course, Miss Haywood and Miss Jones, being the warriors that they were, we got on the Greyhound bus, went to New York to see him perform when he was with the company. Wow. Wow. So oh my maybe goodness. I was about maybe 12 or so. Wow. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, listen, I have a photo. Uh, Heather, can you? Pull up uh, Sandra's photo really quickly. Let us take a gander at it real quick. Thank you, Heather. Uh, that was a photo of Arthur Mitchell, probably in that period. Uh, I think, uh, uh, teaching a boys class. And the third boy is George Faison. Yes, yes. Yes, <laughs> which is amazing, amazing. So let's watch um, the video for uh, Sandra Fortune Green that I prepared. Uh, it, it starts off with her, uh, her life's work, uh, ballet, and it ends with uh, some of her students uh, dancing in some of my work uh, at the Kennedy Center Residency Program. So here we go. Nineteen forty one. We as a country were entering the Second World War, and segregation was the norm, particularly in a city like Washington, DC. But they had a vision and turned it into a burning mission that forged a prima ballerina named Sandra Fortune. But it was Sandra Fortune who helped Doris and Claire realize their dream of producing a prima ballerina when she competed in the International Ballet Competition in Moscow. She's well respected by the dance world, and I don't mean just in Washington. And uh, she went to Russia. She was the first black ballerina to go to Russia at 19. And uh, we admired her greatly because that was a trial. She went there for the Moscow competition. The best dancers all over the world. I mean, the very finest. And um, she did beautifully. The interesting thing about the dance is that uh, parents seem to feel if they put their children in a ballet school, they'll get young ladies who look like ballet dancers. You can't look like a ballet dancer until you've worked like one. Do you see yourself as carrying on in her footsteps? Well, actually, I do. Actually, I really do. I want to. I think the school should go on. The, the, her legend, her dreams, and all of that should continue. And I think that I'm pretty familiar with what she wants, and I think I could do it. I think she wants me to, and I really want to do it because uh, it's a part of Washington's history, and it should continue, and it will. I'm still finding my own voice that's a combination of who they were as my teachers and who I am as the artistic director, and more importantly, is who I am as a woman.
Awesome, awesome, awesome. So that was uh, Miss Sandra Fortune Green and the three young ladies that were the soloists my first year, that was my first year uh, working for the Kennedy Center Residency Program. And Sandra Fortune Green blessed me with three lovely young ladies, uh, uh, two of them, the Figgins, Samantha Figgins and Janelle, uh, uh, Janelle Figgins, an uh, alum of Dance of Harlem and now with Aston, Aspen Santa Fe. And another young lady, Danielle, I forget Danielle's last name, but beautiful. Oh, do you remember Sandra? I'm sorry. Danielle Riley. Danielle Riley, yes. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely dancers. So thank you for that. Um, it, it was wonderful watching because uh, it, it shows you the legacy, the legacy and the connections, the connections that we all have. Um, any, anything you'd like to say, Sandra? About, I, what I want to know, Sandra, we can start our conversation now. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, you know, when you talk about diversity, equity and inclusion, they often talk about it uh, being what occurs in spaces where people of color have not been. But honestly, how in, in, in that day, being 19 years old, going to Russia, first of all, I would have been scared to death for you, you know? <laughs> how to, to do an international ballet competition as a young African-American woman uh, at the time, what, what was that like? It was horrifying. First mm -hmm. of all, um, I lost 21 pounds and I was only there for three weeks. The first couple of days, I was falling because of the rake stage, which was a new experience for me. Obviously, I could not find my balance, but I had a lovely Russian ballerina coach. Her name was Nina, and she was magnificent. She was very supportive. She was very strict, and she was very demanding. Um, it was a horrifying experience, but I was <laughs> able to get through it. Yes. There was three parts. I had enough points to do the first and the second part, but I was eliminated for the third point part because I didn't have enough scoring to move on to the third closing section. Hmm. And 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 the the, the people, how did they respond to to you? Uh they responded quite beautifully. Uh, I did hmm. the Don Q pas de deux, and that was very welcoming by the audience. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the next part was a con the, the contemporary section. And I did um, a piece of Miss Jones's choreography there. So okay. it was, I, I, I believe when I look back on that, that it was a very welcoming um, acceptance. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Donna and Jeanette, um, you guys are indefatigable like people that understand not only, like I, I, I do the art side, but without people like you, I often tell people I graduated from Juilliard. In fact, for Joplin dances, when the premiere came or when Ms. Mitchell wanted me to do the ballet, I'm sorry. He told me go around the corner to this office and he put me in front of this woman. Her name was Patricia Bronstein. I had no idea what she did. She was a development director, you know? And I was like, oh, what is that? You know, because in my life, only thing that mattered was Mr. Mitchell, and Lorraine Graves, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at that time. So, 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 ladies, um, uh, starting with Donna first and then Jeanette, um, your life's work in, in merging these two different things: your the, the culture, the African American culture, an audience, and this other these all of these other things for you, Donna. Mm -hmm. I felt it was critical to empower the Black community to own their experience with Dance Theater of Harlem and to feel as if they had every right to be there in the audience celebrating and enjoying the experience. But at that time, especially in the late 80s, you know, many of the presenting venues weren't quite sure of how to engage the Black community. And that's when I developed the National Audience Development Task Force. So my job was to travel around the country six months before a performance date and then look for the leaders and influencers in the community and empower them with building building a strategy, sustainable audience. I never heard anyone say no, but then again, they may have said I didn't hear it. But the point was, you know, I made sure that the black community took leadership and they were invited into the marketing rooms and they helped build the strategies 
and they made recommendations and suggestions. And that to me was just critical. So I really made, made put every effort I could make into that. And we saw the results around the country. You know, our box office increased significantly, but more importantly, the audiences look like us. And that was just so gratifying. And it was something Mr. Mitchell really had asked me to do. You know, one time we were on tour very early on and he said to me, Donna, we're in these major urban cities. Where are the black people? And I said to myself, that's a good question. So that's when I started to ask the presenters, what are you doing? And realized that they needed support. And so as usual, Mr. Mitchell was creating another revolution. That's exactly, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Jeanette, again, merging all these things, uh, it, it's a, it's, it's, it's complicated and it's not. I and mean, we've had lots of conversations about this. Uh, yeah. what, what are your thoughts? Well, so I, I sit on the side of, of education, right? So my work is within the K-12 environment and I work obviously for a large institution at the Kennedy Center, but a lot of this is about identifying and creating opportunities for the next generation. And for a program like Dance Theater of Harlem at the Kennedy Center, it was about identifying young people that had the potential for great excellence, as well as young people who were already interested in this form. Being able to see members of co the company like yourself, like Lorraine Graves, um, like Lowell Smith, um, you know, all, all of the artists that were there, Fabian Barnes, but to meet and learn from someone who has traversed and become a professional was a huge piece for the work for us. And as we were able to identify this cadre of young people that um, were interested in learning at the feet of accomplished professionals that looked like them, and then have now gone on and done additional work, it also, uh, it was a combination of audience development, but also pathway development. So for us, really it was, about, this is a great need for us at this institution to identify, uplift and recognize the excellence in the African-American community in this professional genre of ballet. So uh, really it's about continuing to share that message. Um, and of course, to work with my colleagues in development and marketing to say there is indeed a market for this. And it's our job to continue to support that pipeline. Um, you know, you know, Jeanette, I just, oh, I'm sorry, Donna, did you want to say something? Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm, I'm chiming in with Jeanette. I'm saying that's right. That's right. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jeanette, you know, oftentimes with dance education, there is this uh, a kind of thing where it's either vocational and for play and then like the serious people. And Mr. Mitchell oftentimes tried to blend both groups together because he believed in that. Um, I've heard you speak on that. Can you add to that, Jeanette, a little? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about the residency in particular, and what we also saw in, in, in the New York program, which of course we tried to emulate in DC, was that you, you provided the opportunity at a young age for those you didn't even know if this was the pathway that they were going to go. But um, as he articulated so well, this was about building um, excellence. This was about looking at connections between um, arts professional world, but also how you're going to carry yourself in the general world. These are people who are gonna be patrons. These are people who are gonna be exceptional professionals, but the discipline and aspects of being engaged in ballet and that training transcended whether or not someone ended up being in that realm. And I think that's really what stood out. I see a number of outstanding business people now who had their, who had some of those beginnings um, in, in the residency with Dance Theater of Harlem, both in New York and DC and other communities, but really recognizing what you put into life is what you're going to get out of it. And the training that you get through a program like DTH was something that I really could see that pathway and how, how it articulated. So that was where the intersection was um, really around appreciation as well as an opportunity to engage in the forum. Awesome. Uh, uh, Ashante, um, there are lots of people that are watching. Uh, a, a question has come through the chat that speaks to um, su uh, a family support, family member support. What was that like for you? Uh, I know getting to the Kennedy Center, you know, 9 a.m., sometimes 8.30 or 20 weekends in, the, in a row, um, sometimes it's challenging. So, um, so how can dance family members uh, provide uh, for developing dance and supporting them? Is that a thing, first of all, Ashante? It is, it, it really is. It does take a village and it's important that you know people stay connected, family, friends to help. Um, I'll give an example. When I was participating in the residency program, um, I was also attending Baltimore School for the Arts. And we had a nutcracker season, I think, um, Mr. Garland, you remember, and we had to hurry up and leave yes. and go all the way to Baltimore 
And it wasn't an option to say, oh, well, we're just gonna skip Saturday. We understood how important this opportunity was to train with you all and at the Kennedy Center. So it, it, it was about family members coming together and coming up with a plan because they understood the end goal. Um, so yes, it is a thing. I would like to see more of it. I try to instill that in our families that dances into the Washington because it, it is extremely important. It is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra, uh, please add. add uh, yes. Um, the families at the Jones Haywood Dance School are extremely supportive. And I believe that if you have the commitment from the parents, you will have the child. And as I have matured in this discipline of teaching, I realized just what you said, Robert, that the tools that they get from dance are the tools necessary in any discipline that they are in. Mm -hmm. And I always tell the kids, if you are good, you will work. And um, I'm very fortunate of the parental support that I have at Jones Haywood. And I tried to, just like Ashanti said, she had to leave DC and get all the way to Baltimore. I believe that with good planning and support, these young people can get it all done. Their schoolwork, their dance, their civic opportunities, their chores. And then you get to do what you like to do. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you, yes, yes. And Absolutely. I'm very, I'm very blessed of the parental support that I have at the school right now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny. I, I wrote down a note just now. It's kind of a funny note, actually. You know, whatever Linda Figgins, the mother of the Figgins <laughs> daughters, has between Dion, Janelle, and Samantha, yes. somehow she did it. Somehow she did it Yes, with and all Dion, of those girls. Dion is working with me now at the school. Uh, okay. Well, there you go. Yeah, and Robert, can I mention something also just about the parental support? Because we definitely, you know, we had students that were Duke Ellington students. We had students from Baltimore School for the Arts. We had students that were Jones Haywood. Uh, I would also say being clear with families about how they can support each other. So one of the things that we had incorporated was a parent meeting. People found out how they could carpool together. What were the yep. things they could do with their students? Would they attend performances and events? Would they help each other with meals? But finding the uh, your other parent support network was really critical. Um, and, and finding appropriate opportunities for parents to also be engaged with the school. How can you best help? Could you be involved with marketing? Could you be involved with, you know, sharing other things? So really our finding a pathway to help parents be supportive to their students and to back to the school is, is really critical. I just wanted to mention that as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and it's so funny. And you are a um, uh, uh, keynote address that we showed an excerpt from Donna. You talk about doctors and nurses and it remind me of now, now we have the new thing, essential workers. You know, and those were essential workers who are still on the front line to this day. Um, can you speak to uh, people that say, uh, you know, I can't afford to go to the theater. I can't afford to, you know, put my daughter in dance class. I can't afford, you know, like people that, that may not think about it and uh, the benefits of it. Hmm. Well, you know, having been a dancer myself, I mean, that's what spurred my interest in wanting to work in a, in a ballet company and, and in theater and still working 40 years later uh, in the arts. And so I think the, the initial introduction and exposure to the arts is really critical. And I think that uh, parents or caretakers uh, can find creative ways to do that. There are a number of free activities um, and it's a question of value. So I think when you really value, how do I want my young person to grow up? What things do I want them to be exposed to? Because once you connect with the arts, I believe your life opens up in just unlimited ways. And so it's having that commitment to figure that out. My mom was a single parent and she took my twin sister and I when we were five years old to see the Bolshoi Ballet in Chicago at the, auditor, at the uh, Airy Clown Theater. And we were, I'm sure, the only black people in that entire theater. And I have no idea why she thought we should go, but she did. And from that moment, I turned to my mom and said, I want to be a ballerina. And so it was at one time, you know, and so I think that one is it's feeling empowered as people of color that we can sit anywhere we want, that we can go and be there and bring our families and children with us, but also looking for those opportunities. If we feel that the price point is prohibitive, then we find a way around that. 
The point is I'm going and I'm taking my kids. And so that that's what I experienced growing up. And I certainly try to support that as well. Very important. Wow. Yeah, you know, uh, something's come through the chat about um, uh, because all of this, this uh, kind of for Dancing of Harlem, this modus operandi, this way of working uh, in, 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 in that structure, uh, uh, Shanti said, it does take a village, you know, and, and, the, and the beauty of working within that uh, uh, paradigm is really, really amazing. I think sometimes uh, when they first come to Dancing of Harlem, they're like, oh, they don't mean that. You know, and then you realize over the years that, I mean, uh, that this, the, you people are my lifelong, uh, uh, will be in life forever, you know? So uh, can we talk about Mr. Mitchell's um, way of being that that sort of, uh, this from Zeta, <laughs> my friend Zeta, how Mr. Mitchell initiated that process? Yeah. How, what kind of uh, uh, ways that he did that? Um, Ashante, can you talk a little about that? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Garland. Uh, Mr. Mitchell's process, I mean, first of all, it, it was excellence in everything. Excellence in everything from the moment we entered the room to exiting. I, I really appreciate the level of discipline. Let me tell you, you couldn't be late. Mm. One minute late, one minute late. No. You think there's just a minute. You would have to sit and watch, it happened to me. And I realized early means on time and uh, stuck with the rules. There were no cut cards. Um, but what I really appreciate in, in Mr. Mitchell is his presence. And it was, it was the way he commanded the room. It was in love, but, but he didn't expect anything less. And he knew if he saw more, he would get it out of you. Um, I, I just, I, I really, I really appreciate um, everything that he left, it was really, really, back then it's like, oh my goodness, it's tough. Yeah. You have to work hard. Right, right. And you know, one thing that I want to, because we're getting close here that I want to really, really raise is this idea of flesh on tights and shoes. Because mm. it's something that we've done forever. And now they're late to the party. We're glad they're here. But the reality is we've been doing this for 52 years. In fact, the woman that it was first done on lives in DC. Her name was Janchi Stevenson. Yes. And she, yes, and she is. You you remember her, Sandra? Yeah. Yes, she yes. was at Jones Haywood. Uh huh. It, exactly, exactly. She was the one that started that. So, uh, all everyone out there watching, don't get it twisted. We were the yes. ones that started that. And the reason I say that is because way back in the '90s, when I ran the school, you know, the kids would come for the summer, wear the flesh and tights and shoes go back home and inevitably I get hundreds of calls of kids that were upset because they could not wear their flesh and tights and shoes at their home schools. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was for years, for decades. And so now I'm glad that people are coming around, but can we have people come around and acknowledge where it comes from, please? That's right. uh, you know, thank you. Uh, any commentary on that from any of the ladies here? Mm -hmm. Because it is a lady, lady thing. The flesh tone tights and shoes, I, I would like to speak on that. Truly thankful for that because I felt comfortable in my skin. And yeah. um, it really was about the line, one line. I mean, and it looked good. We felt good in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'll never forget, I would be up late spray painting because it was spray paint, you know, then when I first started the shoes. And you have the little cracks in the shoes, then you had the canvas, you then could, pancake it, but as that process, that it was beauty within that because we were learning about our identity and not apologizing. And um, I, I think, you know, it really, really set a level and a tone of a confidence that mm -hmm. I can't compare to mm -hmm. others. So I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If awesome. I could just mention also this about the parent connection. I mean, the other thing was that the instructions on how to do that were shared with families. One of the things, when you asked about Mr. Mitchell earlier, and I think it also ties to um, the flesh, you know, the flesh matching um, shoes and tights and so on, all of that really connected back to a self-acceptance and a self-love, which was also displayed not only to the students, but to their parents, by the families coming to learn how to support their child in doing that aspect. Mm -hmm. I think it was also incredibly powerful. There was no skin tone that was considered more ideal or not. It was really about how do you match this to you? And then how do we show that on stage? 
to mm -hmm. show that level of acceptance, that really beautiful rainbow of young people that were there dancing, and then of course as professionals. So that really stood out to me um, in, in watching that experience and watching our parents watch that happen with their young people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, Chani Bell, a former um, uh, dancer to her own Kennedy Center residency student. You, you remember Chani? Yes, Chani? Oh, yeah. I think so. Yeah, Chani um, now teaches jazz fusion for the dance at her home school. And we were talking to her class really innocuously. And I was like, you know, Chani, you know, back in the day didn't even, she had to do her own tights and shoes. And, and then Chani said, yeah, Mr. Garland, you know, it was a family event. Her mother, her father, and her sister Taylor all went out to go find the right shade of shoes for her. And so, yes, it, 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 it's bigger than just mm -hmm. a line. It, it, it was much more uh, the idea of being holy who you are. I put that out there because I'm really looking at this panel of Black Girl Magic here. This is really <laughs> awesome. Uh, and and I'm, this has been, been my month for that. I'm sorry, go ahead, Sandra. Well, I just wanted to add to the family support. I'm very happy that since we are all taking class on in Zoom, that 95% of the students at Jones Haywood all have a bar and a piece of Marley floor. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, there you go. Mm -hmm. Supporting our own, supporting yes. our own. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. So I think that we've um, come to the end of our hour. Any last um, minute uh, recollections or ideas that you would like to see keep going? Give Take Show was in there. I hope Monica Stevenson is watching. Uh, that dog on give take show and never leave us. <laughs> any, any any ideas before we go? Can we start with uh, Ashante, please? Sure. Um, for those who are watching, it's just you. The sky's the limit. Um, do not limit yourself. If you hear one no, um, there'll be some yeses coming along your way. Um, you have to continue to work hard, and you have to keep your eye on the prize. Mm -hmm. Wow, uh, it's amazing to me that you have your masters in. Arts administration. I'm just loving that. And I know Jeanette is as well. Jeanette, uh, do you have anything to, to close with? Oh, I would just say I, I'm so excited to see Ashante and some of the other dancers that were in the program over the years and Mr. Legacy, Mr. Mitchell's legacy live on. His impact is is going to be for over so many, so many centuries. And so I'm just grateful um, for Dance Theater of Harlem and the, the legacy Mr. Mitchell has left in terms of excellence and supporting the next generation. Mm, okay. Um, there, there's something coming through the chat, but I'll move on to Donna and then maybe, if you ladies don't mind spending a couple more minutes, uh, if you have a, okay, all right. Donna, any last minute recollections? Yes, I wanted to just share a quote from Mr. Mitchell. You know, in 2015, he had a wonderful event at Columbia University when he transferred his papers there. And I was there and I wrote a blog about it. And I just wanted to share one quote. During the Q&A session, um, Mr. Mitchell said to the dancers in particular, he said, leave something behind to make a mark or leave a footprint. When you have technique and beauty, you must share it. Take the art off the shelf and make it accessible so everyone can enjoy it. That was from Mr. Mitchell. Wow, awesome, awesome. You know, um, the Kennedy Center uh, for about 20 years, we, we went there consistently. Two week seasons, the only company uh, to perform there. Uh, yeah. Many, many major companies had, did not even stay there that long. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was an amazing, amazing, we always opened with Serenade. And, um, and the reason for that, honestly, is because it was known, and, and probably still is known a little bit, as Chocolate <laughs> City. Uh, so can you speak to, Sandra, before we go, a little bit about the Black history of the people, the Black history, the history of Black people in D.C., well, um, and how that connects to our success there? It's, it's incredible because we have a lot of Black entrepreneurs in D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the Ben's Chili Bowl who is, uh, we have Industrial Bank, 80 years, which is right across the street from Jones Haywood. And we have uh, a, a plethora of artists that grew up in DC. We have Lewis Johnson, of course. We had Fabian uh, George Faison. 
And when Fabian moved to DC, he and I got to know each other because he was one of my ballet friends. And we did the Black Caucus fashion show together. And I had a beautiful Bob Mackey gown. And uh, we have the Theral Smith, who was the other icon dance teacher. We had Bernice Hammond. And we had Mike Malone and Peggy Cooper Kafritz who kept the arts thriving, who are the co-founders of the Duke Ellington School of the Arts. And I am so happy to, to have grown up in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And I just would like to share that Jones Haywood, this is their 80th anniversary. Wow. And the fact that I have been at Duke Ellington since 1978, I retired, and now I'm back on a consulting contract. Virtual applause. <laughs> and I, I have just, it's been hard, but if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. So yeah. um, I try to tell the children, do not leave any opportunities on the table. Pick it up off the table and go forth. That's right. Awesome. Awesome. You remind me of some of the uh, DC people that I met when I was at Juilliard. Really good friend of mine, Robert Tasha Ford, who was a yes. beautiful dancer. Yeah. We recruited Robin when she was um, uh, eight years old, 10 years old. Yes, and beautiful dancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Tanya Gibson was another one that I remember as well. Adana. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I wanted to add, you know, just wearing the hat as marketing director, and of course, Kennedy Center was such an important venue for us, you know, to meet our earned income goal. Um, so I was very fortunate that that's right. You know, at the end of the day, I had gone to school at Howard, so I was very comfortable with the DC community. I knew the landscape, um, and so that enabled me to be able to reach into the various pockets to engage the community, particularly for groups. Because as the marketing director, I also had to make sure I was driving group sales. But also, DC housed many of the um, national headquarters for our sororities, our AKAs and Deltas, our Lynx, our Jack and Jill. And so I was able to really uh, engage them as groups and to honor Mr. Mitchell. I remember the Lynx uh, had a big event. Uh, one of Mr. Mitchell, I believe, was probably the first male that they really celebrated. And I remember that they had, we had a big luncheon and a dinner there in DC. And I walked past a table that had their membership directory. Somehow it was just sitting there. So I decided that was there for me to be able to reach out to the various chapters. So somehow it ended up in my bag. But so, so that was a so really great you know, opportunity. And so I utilized the fact that we had all these national headquarters as well as many of the black political organizations. So giving each of them a reason to support DTH, this is our legacy and our history. And without right. you, how can we advance? And so I went to each of them each time and tried to build upon that, you know, to make sure Kennedy Center was a success in every way, you know, so that yeah. we not only meeting our earned income goal, but increasing the participation of African Americans, seeing the kinds of things we were doing in the community. So all of that was so important. And Donna, and, uh, we just finished doing a program with the links this morning at 11 o'clock. That's what I'm saying. I know, right. <laughs> Excellent. I would just say that, the Ken and I would say for the from the Kennedy Center side being there, you know, uh, when Dance Theater of Harlem performed, it was the place to be seen That's as a right. player who is, you know, an accomplished person. That is a place you wanted to go, and to know that there was the residency program, which was providing a legacy of instruction for the next generation. To know that we actually, I have to share also that Dance Theater of Harlem was one of our first companies where we had a student program, a student matinee that sold out every year so that teachers wanted to bring their students who weren't dancers to see the company members for that education program. So there was a huge legacy for both those who were non-dancers, uh, leaders in the community, but wanted to come to see that level of elegance and eloquence on the stage. So please know it was a, it certainly benefited the Kennedy Center too, um, as well as, as we hope Dance Theater of Harlem. Awesome, awesome. All right, it's it's seven oh seven. Uh, we probably could go on forever, but I think yeah. we need to wrap it up, ladies. I want to thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to have this conversation, um, because you. even though it started it's starting under the aegis of Dance of Harlem, it really is a much larger conversation mm -hmm. uh, because um, there's so many things, uh, challenging things that we're still experiencing now. So I want to take this moment to thank each and every one of you for showing up 
And uh, God bless you. And thank you, audience, people out in YouTube land and Facebook land that are watching. Thank you as well. It was a wonderful, wonderful uh, evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice thank to you. see you all. Good to Good see, see you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.